Good morning, dear brothers and sisters. Uh, this is Lon Tobin, Senior Pastor of St. Paul United Methodist Church, welcoming you on this beautiful Lord's Day to another uh, episode or uh, edition of our St. Paul Sunshine. I um, want to remind you uh, that our, our community continues to need your prayers, uh, specifically those within our congregation who have asked for prayer. I ask you to remember Tom Ely, uh, Wendy Gross, uh, Danny Daniels, McDaniels, B. Johnson, Frankie Cox, Mimi Friedman, Brad Terry, and Regan Davis. There are many others, possibly. If you'd like to know more details, if you'll call me, um, I'll be glad to fill you in on what information I do have. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, on this beautiful Lord's Day, we open our minds and our hearts to receive a blessing. We know that every good and perfect gift comes from you, our Father of lights from above. We ask, O oh God, that we would be aware of your presence and your power, of your promise, of your many gifts, and for these we are thankful. But Lord, this morning we also lift up to you our doubts, our fears, our anguishes, our problems, knowing, O oh Lord, that you care for us and that you love us. We ask in regard to these, Lord, strength, patience, and most of all, hope, that as we continue to deal with the diversity, uh, with the uh, adversity in our life, O oh God, that uh, you would uh, give us peace of mind and joy as we go forward into the unknown world above. Continue to be with those who are suffering because of the coronavirus, be it physically, emotionally, financially. We ask, O oh God, in regard to these, that you, your presence be made known to these folks. Be with those especially in need of prayer this day for physical healing. There are those among us who have undergone surgery. There are those among us who continue not to be fully well. There are those among us who mourn the loss of mothers and brothers and very close people to them. And Lord, there are those among us who are discouraged, defeated. We still have faith, God. We still believe that you are there, but the circumstances have so weighed down on us that the darkness threatens to overcome the light of our life. We remember, O oh God, your word that says the darkness shall never prevail against the light. And may the hope of your glory and the promise of your protection shine in our lives like a candle in a dark room, lighting everything that is in there. Forgive us where we have fallen short. Give us time for amendment of life. And in all these things, God, we pray together asking your blessing as we say the words Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen and amen. This morning's message uh, comes from the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John, and I'll begin reading with the first verse. After saying all these things, Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that he can give glory back to you. For you have given him authority over everyone. He gives eternal life to each one you have given him. And this is the way to have eternal life, to know you the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. I have revealed you to the ones you gave me from this world. They were always yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything I have is a gift from you. For I have passed on to them the message you gave me. They accepted it and know that I came from you. They believe you sent me. My prayer is not for the world, but for those you have given me because they belong to you. 
All who are mine belong to you, and you have given them to me, so they bring me glory. Now I am departing the world, and they are staying in this world. But I am coming to you, Holy Father. You have given me your name. Now protect them by the power of your name, so that they will be united just as we are. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. The call comes at three in the morning. And a pastor gets up, washes his face, puts on his clothes, and goes down to the hospital. It's going to be a hard call, and he prays before he gets there. Because he's going to be with someone who is dying. He arrives and the family is around the bed. The person is lying there trying to keep his faith but still trembling because of the unknown ahead. I spend a few minutes talking to the person, talking to the family about the weather, how they're doing, and then finally my attention and the person laying in bed's attention turn to each other. And oftentimes, they ask me to pray. It's a hard prayer. It's a hard prayer asking God's will to be done. And one of the things I found that's easiest to do, to really construct a prayer that's meaningful to that person, is to look at them, hold their hand, and say, what would you have me pray for? The prayers that result from that are sometimes the most touching, most heartfelt prayers you ever pray. Because you see that person, when all else is taken away and they're getting ready to cross over, reveal what's deepest and most personal in their heart. The 17th chapter of John is a turning point. Jesus has spent the last three chapters, 13 or 14, 15, and 16, talking to the disciples and equipping them for his leaving. And, and he has talked about that he longs for the relationship that he and God has to be theirs as well. But then in the 17th chapter of this great gospel, Jesus turns his attention away from the disciples and to God to pray the last prayer he will ever pray. There are great parallels between this high priestly prayer in John and the Gethsemane prayers in the Synoptic Gospels. But Jesus petitions God in this prayer. Now the disciples no doubt heard this prayer. And I think the writer of John intends for us to hear it too. Of course, we hear it from a very different perspective. These disciples have not yet witnessed Jesus' death. But we listen to this prayer on this side of Easter. And we understand that Jesus is praying for us. Because just as the disciples will have to go on without him, we have gone on and will go on without him. And there's some very important things in this prayer, especially these first 11 verses that we need to pay attention to. The first is, I think, that Jesus asked God to return him to the glory that was his before time. This refers back, of course, to the first chapter of John, where John says, before the world was even created, Jesus was there. And Jesus says, the reason that I'm asking you to do this is because I've given glory to your name. How? By completing the work that you have given me. The second, I think, is the reality that Jesus says, I am coming to you, Father, but they are not. I'm leaving them in the world. As a matter of fact, on Pentecost Sunday, we'll see that we are sent into the world not to be part of the world. So what is the world? Obviously, we know that God loves the created order. 
John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We also know that the world, for the Gospel of John, are those people who have not received God and do not know him. Jesus said that the world will never know him because they're not looking for him. So the world is an uh, ambiguous term, and we need to be very clear that God is not pre-selecting some people like God selected some people for salvation. Rather, God would have all to come to him and none be separated from him. But that involves our own free will and whether or not we will accept it. So from my understanding, and I think this is correct, that the world John is talking about is uh, that that group or or that part of the world that stands in opposition to God. In the Bible, to know someone or to know uh, God is to have an intimate relationship with Him, and not it has to be more than head knowledge. It has to be one's whole life turned over to Him. To know Him is to accept not only His blood on the cross for your salvation, but His way of life for the things of God to be important to you and for your total life to be invested in the ways and the purposes of God. Jesus told us to love each other even as he has loved us. And then the most, I think, astounding and perhaps in many ways most convicting thing that Jesus says in this is that we would not only be protected by God, but that we would be one. That's really important to God. As a matter of fact, I would even submit to you that it is the most important thing to God. He says it's important because that's the way the world will know who God is because of our oneness. And that's the convicting part, isn't it? It's almost impossible for us to be one. There are so many things that divide us. There are important things like cultural difference, racial differences, economic differences, class distinction, even the way we worship and where we worship, the denomination we belong to, the church we belong to the political party we belong to, so many things that separate us. And I want you to know, brothers and sisters, I want, I think that one of the things that divide us so much is all these differences. We are culturally ingrained to live our lives based on differences, and the world capitalizes on that by keeping us apart because it makes us emphasize our differences. Jesus says that the way the world will know who God is and who Jesus is, is by our oneness. Now I want to be really clear about this. I don't think Jesus is is asking us to be just like each other. St. Paul in the book of Corinthians famously uses the metaphor of the human body The eye not saying to the ear, you're not important. The ear not saying to the eye, you're not important. But rather, each have their own function, and yet they're united around the same purpose. Throughout this whole discourse, starting with chapter 14, Jesus repeatedly goes back and points to his relationship with God and longing for us to have that same relationship with him. But here in the 17th chapter, he's asking God for an even greater miracle. And this is the greatest miracle of all, that in spite of all of our diversity, in spite of all of our differences, we could be one, just like he and the Father are one. When you think about the Trinity, and you think about their relationship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, their function 
is all very different. We see God as creator. We see Jesus as savior. And we see the Holy Spirit as comforter and empower. And yet, in all their diversity, they are three in one. One united around the purpose of saving all of creation and humanity for all eternity. Might it be a prayer of ours in the contemporary church that in spite of all of our diversity, that would be more important than the differences that we hold so sacred? You see, that's what will separate us. That's what will make us different from the world. And that's the way the world will know that we are of God because we are united. Now, I know there are many folks here who are not a part of St. Paul, but I suspect your church is pretty much like our church. We have people we are more affiliated with. We have people that we know better. We have people that have common interests with us. And there are those who are extremely different. To be a follower of Jesus, to be one who follows the master who always reached out, to those who are different is to not only tolerate, not only entertain, not only be sociably kind to the people who are different, but to actually celebrate the diversity that is in our own churches and in the community and welcome in into the fold of God. Our youth minister, Jesse Harrell, has been doing a wonderful job in his messages on sanctification. And I hope you've been listening in on our YouTube channel to those messages. Je Jesse's going through the particulars of what sanctification looks like and, and how we work towards sanctification. I'm afraid sanctification has fallen out of favor. Not too many people think too much about sanctification anymore. But I want you to know it's important to God and it's important to Jesus. Because you see, sanctification, as Jesse has very well pointed out, is us becoming like Jesus. The whole, the whole point of sanctification is that when each of us makes being like him more important than us being different from everybody else, we will be pursuing sanctification. And, and even more important than that, it's to understand that in the beginning, God created us in his image, in the image of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, diverse in its function, but united in its mission and purpose. My brothers and sisters, there are many ways to measure greatness in the church. One way is to measure economic stability. Another is to measure mission work. Some people emphasize evangelism. But I feel with all my heart, and I think this is what Jesus was praying for, the most intimate, the most sacred thing that he wanted God to grant would be for us to be one. Last week, I suggested to you that one of the reasons Jesus ascended was to give us space for us to discover who God created us to be. And perhaps this oneness which Jesus longs for, which is God's standard for greatness, is how well we all conform not only to him as his image, but also how we love one another and how we cooperate with one another. Not suppressing our differences, not trying to everybody be the same, but rather to celebrate the diversity that it was in our body and give God thanks that we're all not like each other. That just as we are diverse, so is our world diverse. And there's room at the table for everyone here. And not only are you tolerated, but you are welcomed. We've got a dose of being isolated with this COVID-19 virus. 
And I know and I have all faith that in due time we will be back at church again. may not look the same as it looked in the past, but we will return. One of the things I hope for most that when we return is that we never forget how terrible it was to be socially isolated. How restricting it was to be socially isolated. How crippling it was to be socially isolated. But you know, there's more than social isolation. There's spiritual isolation. When we are separated because of doctrine, because of worship style, because of our own prejudices, because of our economic situation, when we stay at opposite ends and don't come together at the middle, the cross, we are not reflecting the image of God. And furthermore, to stand opposed to God is not only to deny his existence. To know God is more than just mental assent. But it is to make it our goal to love one another just like God loves us. There's one more thing. And I ask that you think about that this week. Jesus longed so much for his children, his followers, to be one with him just like he was one with the Father. But in order for us to be one with him, we must be one with each other. As long as there is no unity and diversity, then we are part of the world and not part of him. May Almighty God give us the grace as we go forward into the world to be one with each other, not just in word, not just in tolerance, but really striving to find our unity in Christ. We often say that God is bigger than any of our problems. Well, I want you to remember, brothers and sisters, God is bigger than any of our differences, too. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.